I heard a joke this week. You've probably heard it before. It's a great joke. So probably it's a famous one. I just never heard it before. This Jew wants to go and pray. But um, he can't go to the shul. Because no shuls. He figures he'll go to the next best, best thing. He goes to a church. He puts on his towels and his tomb. And he's shaking over there and davening. And he's getting into it. And the priest wants to begin the service. But the Jew is so noisy, so loud. Baruch Shamar Vahaya Allah, middle of the church. <laughs> so the priest screams out, finally, you can't take it anymore. He says, Please, will all non Christians leave? The Jew ignores him. <laughs> the priest is getting annoyed. So the priest says, Again, will all non Christians please leave? So the Jew ignores him again. Finally, the priest can't take it anymore. Shema Yisrael, he can't take it. So he says, Will all Jews please leave? The Jew picks up his talisman film, picks up the statue, and as you see, Bubala, they don't want us here. He walks out. <laughs> <laughs> so, there is, um, there is a, a very um, powerful message from tonight's Sfira. Tonight's Sfira is Teferis Shev Yisot, the beauty of bonding. And I wanted to understand what exactly is beauty of bonding. To understand it, let's look at what the opposite of this is. In the, in the Pirkei of Pirkei Avos in this week, chapter 4, we learn in the Mishnah four lessons. The Mishnah tells us that if to be careful when someone's in a uh, very emotional state, not to, um, not to tread on their space and to give honor and respect to where they are. Misha says, and you find it. Misha says. Misha says like this. It says, you cannot comfort someone when they are angry. You cannot try to calm them down when they're angry. Why not? The person's angry, and if you try to comfort them when they're angry, they'll feel like you just don't get them. They'll feel like, like you're insulting them. They've, you're putting up a wall between you and the other person because the person feels like you're saying not to get angry, you're saying not to get upset, but if it happened to you, you will get upset. And the person's not going to listen to you anyways. He's, he's, he's angry, he's not going to try to comfort him. It doesn't matter, not a big deal. It is a big deal, he's, he's angry. So Mishnah says don't comfort someone when they're angry. The second instruction of Mishnah is, here are ye. The second instruction, are ye. The second instruction of the mission is don't comfort someone when they're, when they're, someone passes away, God forbid, you, you can't give them an acham, you can't comfort them when they made the mutl of fun of, when the dead body is there in front of them, you can't comfort them. Why not? Of course, the person is unable to receive comfort then. He's right now in a, total, in a state of total grief, and you can't, you can't comfort. People say, oh, he's in a better place now. He knows what's going on. He, he's, he's, he's free from his illness. He has nachat from his children now. He sees what's really going on. All those words are empty to the person who just, just experienced losing someone so dear to them. And the mission continues and says, don't ask someone to, about their vow. The person made a vow. The person made a promise. And you know that their promise is not going to really... Um, be able, they won't be able to keep their promise. But while they make that promise, don't try to dissuade them. They're in like the heat of the moment. Don't ask them about their promise while they make made their promise. We know the celebrated like Baomer. We know Rabbi Akiva that his father-in-law made an oath that if his daughter marries Rabbi Akiva, she won't get a penny from his estate. He was very wealthy. And then Rabbi Akiva came to visit the town and he didn't know this was, was Rabbi Kiva. And he wanted to know his value. He didn't know where his daughter was. And the sages of Israel asked him, if your daughter would be someone like him, like Rabbi Akiva, would you uh, make this vow? And he said, of course not. And the vow was a no. But when the person's in the heat of the moment, years before, 20, 30 years before, when she wants to go out with this shepherd, that's, that's, that's don't, don't talk to him about it. And the fourth instruction of the Mishnah is, Don't try to look at someone when they make a mistake. 
Don't try to see someone when they're doing a mistake. Because it could be they'll get so embarrassed that you saw what they did that they won't be able to ever come back to themselves and they'll be totally, totally derailed. I'll never forget, I was in yeshiva and it was, it was a fast day. And no one really got up that morning. And there was one boy, very, very studious, and he got up early. But I, was, I saw from a distance that he was, uh, took a drink in the morning, you know, like... <laughs> and I felt so bad that he saw that I saw him. Because whatever, whatever his issue was with the fast and whatever with this thing is one thing. Once someone sees you, it becomes a whole different problem. It can really derail you. You, you, you lose your own self-image because someone else knows about your issue. You have a whole kind of different anxiety. So this mission tells us, try not to see someone when they're falling. Try not to look at them when they're falling. So it seems like this mission is telling us very simple things. Things we know by ourselves. So the question is, why is the mission telling us this? Another question is, <coughs> what if you have a unique relationship with someone? What if you have a unique bond with someone? And this person looks up to you really deeply. They have a lot of respect for you. And they will listen to you. The mission doesn't say any exceptions. Misha says, never comfort someone when their dead is before them. Never try to comfort them when they're angry. Why never? What if this person has deep respect for you? And they will listen to you because they, they respect you so much. Why does Misha make this, this, um, this uh, blanket statement? Never. What if you're their teacher, they're your student, there's this deep bond between you? Why not then? So to understand this, we have to look more about the midah of yesod, the midah of bonding that we're working on tonight. There is in Kabbalah three different areas, three different kinds of divine energy. There's what's called the right, the left, and the middle. For our purposes, let's just say this. There is chesed. Chesed is from Hashem's right hand, and ourselves also chesed is from the right. Yesod is not just different than chesed. Yesod is a whole different area. What's the difference between chesed and yesod? Yesod means to bond with someone, be close to someone, to be a little closer to someone. That's yesod. How is that different to giving them kindness? What's the difference? There was um, a chassid the Alt Rebbe. His story really brings out the difference. Amazing. The chassid the Alt Rebbe, who uh, was a gifted school teacher, and the Alt Rebbe wanted to hire him to teach his son in the middle of The Alt Rebbe approached him in a very interesting way. Everyone knows the second part of the story, but no one ever pays attention to the first part of the story. The first part of the story is the Alt Rebbe says to him. I have a mitzvah of teaching my son. You have a mitzvah of feeding your family. Let's, let's switch mitzvahs. I'll feed your family, and you learn with my son. What did the Atabah do over there? The Atabah was telling him, I don't want this to be a job. You have a job, you have a paycheck, nine to five, whatever the time is, and then you're done. I want this to be your own burden. I want this to be something that you take upon yourself. This, this is your child. And the Atabah said also, I'm not just asking you to do that. But I'm going to do the same thing myself. I'm going to, not going to give you a salary. I'm going to do the mitzvah of supporting your family. It, this is what Pirkei Avot describes as no seba olm chaveru. To carry the burden of someone else with them. With them. If not, chesed means that you are you and I am me and I feel that you're missing something and I want to give you what you're missing and I want to move on. That's chesed. Chesed leaves you very lonely. Chesed leaves you, you become the object of someone's mitzvah. Maybe you appreciate the kindness. Maybe there was love in the kindness. But your soul means... And no sabon chavero, and the person who's giving you feels you. Not just they're giving you. And they may not give you. They may, they, they may not give you. They may not be able to give you. But no sabon chavero means that they took your, your burden upon them. Could be that this teaching the Alt-Rebbe is something that was in, runs in the family. The Alt-Rebbe's um, brothers were all great Torah geniuses, Torah giants. And the story goes, I don't know the source of the story. Someone asked the Alt-Rebbe's mother, what was... Well, how do you merit to have such amazing children? So she said the following story. She said that she hired a school teacher, and one day the school teacher has this like farchmur at the face. Farchmur, I say farchmur in the Farsi, charabe, very charabe the face. So, so, um, so she looks. She says, "What's wrong?" She said, "Well, your husband Rabbi Baruch bought you a new coat and the new dress, and." My husband um, and my wife is wondering why can't I get her a new coat and new dress? So she didn't think twice. She right away took the coat and the dress and said, give this to your wife and tell her you got it for her. 
what what she wanted to do wasn't just to like make the teacher feel better or the wife feel better. She, she was carrying the burden with her. She felt this t- school teacher is not really present with her child, and 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 she wanted to help him be, be present. It's so important for, for for those who are teaching our children that they get compliments from us, the parents, because if they get a compliment from the parent, and you say and you, and you tell you tell your school teacher, you know, uh, my Zalman repeated something that you that you said, <laughs> it makes the school teacher feel like like you're not with them together, that there's a connection, and then the Torah says, Vishinantam levanacha, teach the Torah to your children. The Gemara says your children actually means your students. Why does the Torah say teach the Torah to your children? If it means your students, it should say students. Why does it say teach the Torah to your children? Because the Torah wants that a Jew looks another Jew, that they're, that they're, that they're their own child. That's Yisot. Yisot means that you know Sibon Chavere, that you feel the other person's burden, you carry it with them. I think I shared this, I shared this a few months ago. I, was, I went to Didi Hirsch, it says, Institute to help discover um, people who might be in the brink of suicide and how to help them. And one of the things that they taught us was that there's a difference between, between what a person committing suicide needs and a regular person. A regular person might need sympathy. Your person's in a pit, and it's dark. Oh, so I feel so bad for you, they're so dark. A person wants to commit suicide. What that means is that they're blind from any kind of future. They can't imagine anything getting better. They're completely blind. They need air to breathe. For them to have air to breathe, they need someone to get down into the pit with them, and to feel where they are. That's for an adult, being understood, being felt, that's, that's like air. <coughs> so this is why the Mishnah says to us, even if you're the teacher, even if you're gifted, even if you have a really unique relationship with someone, never try to comfort them while their dead is there before them. Why? Because it shouldn't be their dead. It shouldn't be their anger. No, Sabon Chaveri means that it's your anger, that you're angry too, that you're, that you're upset, that you made this nether. If you're able to start comforting them, that means you're not in the right place. That means you're, that means you're not. Ta- you're, you're missing the soda. Your soda is two things. Your soda is a student coming close to the teacher, and the teacher coming close to the student. It says, for example, it says, Sadiq, I'll give you a crazy example, but this is an example. It's true. It's, 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 it's a very good example. This week, there was this homeless guy who came to the show. And uh, he makes a lot of trouble in the shul, and I don't really like it when he comes. And I'm not sure if well, every time I kick him out, if it's a mitzvah or it's an avera. That's my own my own uh, moral dilemmas. <laughs> Anyways, this time he's leaving the shul, and he he'd been already ejected from the shul several times, and he goes like this to me. And my first reaction, like this, first reaction was, like he's like, give me a second. So my response to him was, okay, in a second, I'll come I'll come outside, I'll talk to you in a second. And then I remember the story of J.C. It was the story of J.C. Rabbi Shubham Prachia was a teacher of J.C. And at that time, the, um, the queen, the Jewish people, uh, was a brother, was a sister to Shubham Prachia. And the king was very against the sages. And he Shubham Prachia to run away from the king. He wanted to kill all the sages. And then he found out that the kings had a change of heart and he can come back. On the way back, he was traveling together with his student, Rabbi Shulman Prachia was traveling with J.C. together. And on the way back, they passed by this hotel. And the proprietor of the hotel was very kind to them. So Rabbi Shulman Prachia says, what a nice person. And J.C. Didn't, wasn't on the level of Rabbi Shulman Prachia. He took it the wrong way. He says, I don't like her eyes. In other words, Rabbi Shulman Prachia was complimenting her character. And he took this as a very low physical statement about her physical appearance. Rabbi Shulman Prachia was very upset that a student of his would speak like this. He said to him, no longer welcome in Yeshiv. No longer welcome. You can't come to Yeshiv. Could be. I don't remember that part. You cannot welcome the Yeshiv. So he leaves the Yeshiv. But J.C. said to himself, I want to come back to Yeshiv. I want to try again. He comes back again. Shulman Prachia says, out. Comes back a third time, a fourth time, a fifth time, a sixth time. And finally, J.C. says to himself, you know what? I'm going to try one more time. If he lets me in, good. He doesn't let me in, I'm out. He comes back the seventh time. Shulman Prachia is middle of saying Shema. And Shulman Prachia had made, said to himself the same thing. If he comes back one more time, I'll let him come. One more time he comes, I'll let him come. Shulman Prachia was like this. One second. <laughs> J.C. thought he was saying, Out! Out! He was just saying, Wait a second. But he's out. So because of that, he started his own religion. Because of this, hundreds of thousands of Jews were killed. It's not that he was a tzaddik. He wasn't a tzaddik. He had a lot of issues. He had a lot of problems. 
But had he felt his student where his student was at that moment, he could have saved him. He could have directed him. And then he wrote a new Mishnah. Oh, that's right. Then, then he made a new Mishnah. Yeah. The Mishnah he taught was, go ahead, Shmuel. Don't judge your friend. Don't judge everyone favorably. No, that was the Mishnah. Yeah, judge judge, judge, judge everyone favorably. Anyways, so um, the point I want to say was this. That this guy, when I went like this, I was thinking like, oh my gosh, the guy, the guy came back and kicked him out. I ran after him, Rakshma caught him, and you know what? This guy actually had a really good change in his life. All of a sudden, he had a place to stay, and he was normal. He just wanted to share it with me. He didn't mm-hmm. want anything from me. He wanted to share with me like he's okay now. And I could have lost that, you know? Could have lost oh, that. Yeah. That's Yisod. Yisod means to feel what other person is. And that's the difference between that and the <laughs> And we find this over and over again by Moshe Rabbein. You know, if, if Moshe Rabbeinu's story was reported in the news today, it would have been said this. Moshe Rabbeinu, the hardline leader of the Israelis, of the Israelites, he killed an Egyptian in cold blood because of the unsubstantiated reports that this Jew was being beaten by this, uh, by, by this Egyptian taskmaster. He, Moses also for, brought ten plagues upon the Egyptians. And, he's, and the poor Egyptians are just freedom fighters. Just want to, <laughs> just want to escape. That's, that's what we wouldn't report. Anyways, but, but, but think of Moshe Benu's story. Moshe Benu's story, every step of his life is what he sowed. For example, Moshe Benu grows, grows up in the palace of Pari. What does he do as he soon grows? Pari appoints him to lead, lead this whole household, to be the leader of, and the manager of the whole palace. Moshe Benu goes out. He goes to see what's going on with his brothers. It doesn't say, Vayar et sivlotam, it says, Vayar bis sivlotam. Rashi says, not on Liba Vedaiti, he paid attention with his heart and his mind. What's going on with these people? How are they? Are they okay? What's going on with them? I was, I was speaking to someone today from Israel. He's describing me how he's driving in Israel. And all of the, the whole region is full of fires and whatever. Like, we don't even realize what we don't, we, we, we don't know. It, 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 you, could, you, could, you could read the news, you could learn it but until you're there, you don't really know. Moshe Rabbeinu wanted to really know what was going on. He wanted to feel where they were. And when Moshe Rabbeinu saw the guy killing the, 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 hitting the Jew, what did Moshe Rabbeinu do? Moshe Rabbeinu kills the Egyptian. Why kill the Egyptian? If he kills the Egyptian, he knows the Parakel is going to find out. He knows that he's going, to get, he's going to have to run away. He knows he might get killed. Why doesn't he think about the hundreds of thousands of Jews he could help if he stays in a position in the palace? Why does he go and kill the Egyptian and risk his entire future helping the Jewish people? The answer is because Moshe had Yisod. Moshe didn't feel this was someone else. Moshe was he's hitting me. He's hitting me. Someone's hitting you. You, you. you offend yourself. It wasn't someone else. Famous story. Moshe Rabbeinu with the, the well, helping daughters of Yisrael. But when Moshe Rabbeinu became a shepherd, we all know the story. How one, one sheep, one goat runs away. And Moshe runs after the goat and, and he saves the goat. What's the, what's, what's the chidush? What's the novelty of the story? What's, what's unusual with the story? If you're a shepherd, a sheep runs away, either you... Try to prod it back, or you run after it. That's normal. What's, what's a chiddush? What's unique is this. Unbelievable. The Medjur says that Moshe Rabbeinu followed the sheep. He followed the goat. What did he say? He saw the goat drinking water. Moshe Rabbeinu says, ah, now I know why you left. He wasn't going to bring the sheep back. He was going to find out why the sheep left. And Moshe Rabbeinu said, you're so tired. And he put the sheep on his shoulders. You hear the difference? Moshe Rabbeinu, he, he embodies that tzaddik is called Yisod. Tzadik Yisod Olam. Just like in a house, the ha- the, it seems like such a waste of time, the foundation of the house. The hardest part to build is the foundation. Right? The hardest part to build is the foundation. It takes the longest to build the foundation. The longest. No one ever looks at the foundation. But you need the foundation because it's what attaches the house to the ground. Without it, you can't do anything. The tzaddik is the one who attaches the world to Hashem. And the tzaddik also attaches Jewish people to Hashem. So Moshe Rabbeinu, he uniquely breaks the luchot. Why he break the luchot? One opinion was he wanted to be with the Jewish people in their in their punishment. You want to be in their category, according to one opinion. So, this is, um, I'll tell you one more story, I'll let you guys go. There was, uh, okay, fine, I'll tell you two more things. Let you go. There was, uh, th- there were many Beis Yaakov girls who were together in, during World War II in, in the concentration camp. And they were, they were working in the, in the, as um, seamstresses. And there was one girl, so emaciated, so tired, so broken, that she, in the middle of, of sewing the dress, whatever it was she was sewing, fabric, whatever it was, she fell down, and the whole fabric started to turn and, and get ruined. And the Nazi, Makshima, went over and started kicking her, kicking her, kicking her, kicking Makas Mamas. So the other Bisaka girl started to stop working and looking, she says, go back to work, go back to work. They brought her back to the back, she was, she was not... She didn't look like she was going to survive. And that day they gave him soup. So this girl, who was barely alive, 
She says in a in Mikol Lokol, she says, could I, have, could I have some soup? Soup. And the girls are thinking, why should we give her soup? Soup for them is life. For her, she's not going to survive anyways. She, the soup's not going to mean anything to her. Why should we give her the soup? What's the point? Give her the soup and she's going to die anyways. So, the end, so then one girl gets up and says, listen, it, it's not going to help her live. It's going to help us live. We are going to make Yaakov. And we all work together. We're all friends. We all took care of each other. If we're going to go on with our lives, when this, when this girl is asking us to last request for a soup, we're not going to give it to her, we're not going to be able to go on with our lives. We need this for ourselves. And all the girls started pouring soup on her lips until one on the floor, they lost them. But, but they, they, uh, they, this gave them life, the rest of their lives. That's your sod. Sod is, when you feel, that's the fairship you sowed, you feel the beauty of the connection with another Jew, the beauty of the connection with Hashem, the beauty of the connection of Hashem with us. You know, people always are asking the question, why does Hashem do this, why does Hashem do that? That's not really the question. Mm-hmm. We don't know why. The question really is, it's so lonely, it's so lonely. Today's Hayom Yom talks about loneliness. The first Hasidim of the Alt Rebbe were discussing with each other, what did we achieve by becoming Hasidim? Studying Torah? We studied Torah before. Physical, material blessings, it didn't matter, it doesn't matter now. What, what do we get? Until one Hasid said, before the, before the Alt Rebbe, there was a loneliness. Loneliness between the Alt Rebbe, between the Tzaddik and the students. But now the Alter Rebbe accomplished this novelty that the Rebbe is not alone and the Chas is not alone. I want to show, just want to share with you um, some letter. I just want to share with you this letter that I wrote to a school teacher who felt very lonely. And it's a very beautiful letter, and it really gives us a, vi- a beautiful picture of, of the bond of Hashem with us and the bond that we have to have with each other. And, and, and it makes us realize that Hashem will not let the goals go for one more second than it needs to be. Because Hashem feels our pain more than we feel our own pain. I have to realize that it's not one extra second in Golos. It's not one extra second in exile. The pain that we have, Hashem, is much more pain. Okay, so it, this, is, this is a postscript to a letter to this school teacher. You write about how you're lonely. It's a, I'm paraphrasing. It's a great wonder. Because for sure you know that the teaching of my father-in-law, the rabbi, the leader of the Jewish people, the chassid has accomplished that you're not alone. If this is true for a rabbi and a chassid, how much more so is this true for regular people between each other? And how much more so, it's obvious this is how it, this is true between Hashem and the Jewish people, that we're not alone. And especially this is understood according to the fundamental teaching of our Torah, the Torah of life about divine providence, which means that Hashem, Yiz Baruch, takes care with the divine providence of the details of details of our lives. And Hashem, Yiz Baruch, His care and His blessing and His goodness are all one. His care, His blessings, and His abundant blessing of goodness are all one. Because it all comes from his simple oneness. From all of the above, it's a, it, it trickles down into our uh, practically and in, in, into our feelings and to our perspective of our life. That every single one of us is in a world, a world where there are many kinds of creatures of inanimate vegetation, animal, and human, and we all have an influence on things in the world, and we're also influenced by things in the world. You can't compare the influence of one of the different kinds of things in the world, but we all are influencers of the world, we're all influenced by the world. Since this is true, every single person has content, at least potential content, potential gift, potential something, something they have, something special in them. And it depends on them to bring out what's special inside of them to fruition. This is a fundamental truth about every single Jew, that every single Jew is meant to be a partner with Hashem and creation and share what they have. However, in regards to you, the Rebbe says, the wonder is so much greater. You were merited by divine providence to teach Jewish children, the children of Hashem. Every good deed that you influence these children creates a, in, a, a, in, a eternal bond between you, a spiritual and holy bond that affects you in this world. And in these kinds of things, space does not interrupt. It's impossible for there to be any separation. It's eternal. In other words, when you're sitting in your room, listen to this, the last words, I'll let you guys go. When you're sitting in your room and you feel lonely, and at that moment you're sitting in your room and you're feeling lonely, one of your students or one of the people you influenced is reviewing the Torah class that you, they, they heard from you. Or they're saying a bracha because you taught them to say a bracha. This adds light and life in the bond between you. It's impossible that your neshama doesn't feel an addition, something more, because it's coming from the very core of the neshama. The inside of a person, the, the main part of a person is their neshama, 
and the neshama actually gives life to our animal and human self. I know, the Rebbe says, that not, every, not everybody feels this, because not something you can see with your eyes, or not something, not something you can touch with your hands. But this doesn't take away the truth. Therefore, if you think about this a little bit, you open up a door from your neshama to your mind until it reaches your animal soul to influence you in this direction. A person changes. There are times we need more inspiration than others. So the best advice that tells this woman is meet your students, meet those who you inspired, talk to them. And by talking to them, this will allow, allow you to, um, to, to, bring, to refresh this up. Rebbe said people always um, uh, respond to this kind of thing that he's saying, that you're, you're changing the subject. But the Rebbe, um, Rebbe just concludes that the, reason for your, the, the, real, the, real, the real reason for your feeling this way is because you haven't gotten, gotten engaged, and I want to give you a blessing for this. Um, but the bottom line is, my dear friends, is that a Jew should never feel alone. We should never let other Jews feel alone. And uh, we have to realize that we're not, Hashem is with us. May Rabbi Sarah al Vashon. He told me about this woman who came visit his house. She said, I'm an atheist. You stay in my house for a week. That's all he said. He didn't speak to her one word about God. All of a sudden, she wasn't an atheist. What was an atheist mean? I'm lonely. I'm lonely. She just, they took care of her. They stayed at the house. Oh, there's no, there's, no, there's, no, there's no issue anymore. We have to hold on to each other. That's the fair ship you're means the beauty of connecting to each other. L'chaim, l'chaim. We should realize how close Hashem is with us. How Hashem doesn't let one extra second of Golas. And we should see Taka, the immediate goal of Mashiach Sakaidu. L'chaim, l'chaim. L'chaim, l'chaim. L'chaim, l'chaim. L'chaim, l'chaim. L'chaim, l'chaim.